this presentation is kind of a, a hodgepodge of a lot of things, but I thought I would focus it on the intensive care unit and what happens behind the closed doors. Keep in mind that any of your loved ones or any of your patients, uh, we keep the doors closed in the intensive care unit. And it seems like um, there is some events that occur that I really wanted to share with all of you and shed some light so you would understand exactly what's going on behind these closed doors and uh, what to look for. From the beginning of time till about 1900s, humanity moved fairly slowly in the field of healthcare. Beginning of the 1900s and coming this way, there has been a major revolution in how we understood diseases and how we really treated them. Um, and most of the medical inventions and pharmaceuticals and the understanding of medicine came really after the 1900s. What also made it more possible in understanding is actually the available technologies and electricity. Literally, electricity changed how we practice medicine because now we have equipments that work with electricity. We also had insurance companies and insurance structures that now have money and will be able to pay for these expensive toys and equipments and tests and uh, therapeutics that we have available today. Without that, um, the majority of us will not have been able to afford um, expensive health care. We have plenty of toys in the ICU and the bigger the center and the more sophisticated and advanced the institution, the more equipment and the more sophisticated equipments there are available out there. And here's one principle that just because we can, I can walk into the storage room in the ICU and find multiple devices that are complicated and sophisticated doesn't mean that every patient we need to apply this to. Think about your toolbox. You have a drill and you have a big drill and a big saw and you may all need is a screwdriver. So just because you have everything in the ICU, um, don't expect everything will be used. So don't go to the doctor and say, well, we have a ventilator and a respirator and a three-tier dialysis machine and an upside-down dialysis machine. Can we not use it? Well, your patient needs a Tylenol only. <laughs> now, for people who really don't understand the amount of work, and my hat um, goes out to the uh, nursing staff and uh, physical therapy and respiratory and everybody who works in the ICU, this is actually what we do. This is a continuous dialysis machine. This is about multiple drips. Patient is there. Um, and this is a picture of the internet. So really, it is not an imaginary picture. This is actually what we do in the ICU. Now, a lot of times you hear the news, my loved one or my patient is going to the ICU. And philosophically, the ICU has one major objective, is to keep them in an area where we can protect them from deterioration. It is not when they deteriorated, of course they're going to go to the ICU, but sometimes we have patients that, are, that can go to a regular medical floor or can go to the ICU. I prefer to take them to the ICU to avoid and to protect them in case something bad happens. They will be in a place where there's a lot of resources. So it's really to, pretend, to protect deterioration. And for sick patients, the intensive care unit, there is a physician-patient ratio that you cannot be taking care of 30 patients and 10 of them in the ICU. So you'll spend three minutes with them. You can even barely know if they have a nail polish on their hands or not if, they, if you shake it. So the ratio of physicians in the ICU, nurses ratio, and intense resources. Intense resources when you need a CT scan, when you need an x-ray, when you need things to happen, things will happen. You kind of mobilize the troops in the ICU. Whereas on a regular medical floor, yeah, we'll get to the patient to get an x-ray once we do the ICU step down operating room and uh, pack you. So you have um, intense resources that are available literally at your fingertips. 
And you have observation. You have monitors. You have central monitoring area. You have nurses that sit at the bedside throughout their shift. So it is a place where you cannot breathe uh, while your breath is being watched um, every time. Sometimes um, it is uh, the nurse's ratio is two to one, and in extreme circumstances or unusual circumstances, the ratio will change. But a nurse to a patient ratio is usually two to one, and this is the most, the most area that you have eyes and monitors and lines and drips and things at you that you are being monitored. So if I get sick and there is a potential chance of deterioration, where do I want to go? But here's the issue. The doors are closed. Do we know what happens behind closed doors in the ICU? So when somebody is admitted to the ICU, most people will have a respiratory issue. Or they may have a neurological disorder, massive stroke, they can't breathe, they need observation of their blood pressure, cardiovascular events, um, electrolytes abnormalities, or sepsis, and sometimes intuition. Again, we have a lot of uh, good staff um, in hospitals in this area that will come to me and say, Doc, I'm not sure what's wrong with the patient, but they're really sick and they need to go to the ICU. What should my response be? Absolutely to the ICU. Number one, because that is now being looked at to be part of the senses that we have. We have five physical senses, but we have one that is an intellectual sense, which is intuition. I don't know what it is, but that's where they need to be. And again, the philosophical principle of the ICU is to prevent them from deterioration. So it will not be bad if the patient stays in the ICU for a day and the next day, oh, they look better, they feel better, I'm glad you did not deteriorate. You can be uh, moved down to the floor. Not the floor, but the medical floor. <laughs> <sighs> this is an actor, actually. <laughs> and um, he is, this is a studio in Hollywood. And this is an actual patient. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different drips. And the patient is on the ventilator. Fortunately, the patient did well. So we re he was sick and he deteriorated. And uh, I'm gonna put a uh, good plug for Select. Yes, because he moved, he moved to Select and eventually got extubated and walked home. Now, the ICU is not only about patients, and it's not about nurses, about doctors. The ICU is also about families. So if you have not had a family member or a loved one in the ICU, these are the mixed emotions that you as a person or as a family will have. This will summarize how you feel. Uh, families will be angry, and they will carry their anger against nurses, physicians, techs, dietitians, janitors. And it is understandable. It is not allowable in a way, but it's understandable. You have your loved one yesterday was doing fine, and today they're in the ICU on the respirator. So be tolerant. If you're a provider, be tolerant to uh, uh, those feelings. They'll be exhausted. They sleep on the couch and, and in the hospital, so they, they're not comfortable, and they wake up with every vital sign, and every time a monitor beeps. They'll always have all kind of questions and curiosity. What is that for? This is only saying 99% saturation. Should it be 100? Okay, I get that question so frequently. They always want this. Can we get ice? Where can we get coffee? So please be understanding to that family. That family is going through this. Frustration, anger, fatigue, you name it. Um, they will be frustrated. They will be always impatient. The doctor said he'll be here in five minutes. It's been six minutes. Where is he? <laughs> and they'll always be on the edge. Anytime you say, uh, whatever you say, and whatever tests come back, the sodium is only 142. Should it be 143? And sometimes they have unrealistic expectations. My loved one has been on the ventilator for a day. They're not better yet. What's going on, doc? Please be understanding to those feelings. So if we're going to really talk in details about who gets admitted to the ICU, 
you have respiratory patients who have major respiratory issues. Um, COPD exacerbation, that is a fairly common diagnosis. They come in, they're wheezing, they're short of, short of breath. We are now at a stage, the flu, or in the spring, the um, pollen. So you, we may have a lot of people with um, wheezing and exacerbation. So we prefer to admit those patients to the ICU, and today we have two of those patients in the ICU. They may have asthma, and sometimes asthma becomes so intense, they're so short of breath. <coughs> Pneumonias as well. Now, for people like me, who just hit uh, 50, you need to take the Pneumovax. And uh, we, if any of you work in healthcare, um, and uh, this is now considered a healthcare risk factor, because we've seen a lot of people that are young um, we actually, about a year ago, we lost a young man who works at a nursing home. He's a nurse. He had um, a major pneumonia with uh, pneumococcal pneumonia and eventually passed. So if you have not had a pneumovax, it is a time to have a, a pneumovax because it's actually saved lives. Uh, we admit a lot of patients with rib fractures to the ICU and they say for every rib that is broken, mortality increased by 10%. So you have somebody who's 70 years old, uh, fell at the edge of a coffee table and he has six rib fractures. There is a risk of death of 60%. Yes, because they get pain, they get atelectasis, they end up with a Foley catheter, UTI, respiratory failure, ventilator. Any neurological issue is a ticket to the go to the ICU, acute strokes, those patients may expand their strokes. Those patients may bleed into their strokes. A lot of times, if they're in the ICU and we're doing neuro checks every one hour, and they may have a stroke that is related to a hemorrhage and hypertension, they're taking a blood thinner, and that hemorrhage will expand. It may compromise their breathing. So we do neuro checks every hour, and a lot of times, I, can, I cannot name how many times I get approached by a nurse. Your patient is now doing a lot worse. So we get a CAT scan and there is a, either expansion in the stroke or there is a bleeding within the stroke. So every stroke is admitted to the hospital, I mean to the ICU. Um, seizure disorder, sometimes if somebody has one seizure, it's okay, but if there is what we call status epilepticus, where the seizure is resistant to conventional therapy, they may aspirate, they may hurt themselves, they may get into acute renal failure or anoxic brain events from repetitive seizures. Those patients are admitted to the ICU. Any brain hemorrhage, um, you, if you watch TV like me, you will see a lot of commercials on TV uh, starts with the following. If your doctor puts you on this brand X medicines and you had a hemorrhage, call us, 1-800. We will... Uh, take care of that for you. So keep in mind, uh, there is an increased use in these medications to prevent strokes, blood clots, DVTs, and so forth. So uh, sometimes one of the small rate, uh, percentage of those patients will have a hemorrhage. And if it's a brain hemorrhage, we need to admit them to the ICU and uh, watch over them as well. Any brain surgery, any spinal cord surgery, because it's so delicate, and any hemorrhage can lead to serious, potentially irreversible, devastating, debilitating damage. So we put those patients in the ICU as well. And any patients who comes in that is confused, combative, we don't know what's wrong with them. Could be meningitis, could be encephalitis, could be withdrawal from drugs, um, alcohol, taking so many uh, medications. And one thing that I wanna warn you, um, we have in our community now, we've seen it in the ICU, a, uh, fentanyl that is horse fentanyl that you can buy it from China and it comes uh, via either DHL or uh, FedEx. So we, it work, it is 10 times more powerful and that's why we've seen a lot of death related to drugs from those medications because it is a calibrated 10 to one and people think they're taking one portion but they're actually 10 portions. Um, and I forgot the name of it, but it's a chemical, it's an opioid chemical that is now um, killing people um, in our community. Um, 
Cardiovascular events that lead us to admit patients to the ICU, uh, of course, heart attacks, or what is considered a threatening heart attacks or um, unstable angina. Um, those patients get admitted to the ICU, they get observed, cardiac rhythm is observed, they are on medications, and the cardiologist is right there within reach. So this is an indication to be admitted to the hospital. Sometimes the rhythm um, is flip-flopping, atrial fibrillation, ventricular ectopy, uh, ventricular tachycardia, uh, pacemaker malfunction, or pacemaker is firing because the heart had a cardiac event and a cardiac arrest, and the only thing the patient says, well, I was dizzy and about to pass out, and the next thing is, whoop, I was shocked. So the pacemakers or the defibrillators sometimes shock those patients and they come to the hospital and we know those patients had what is called either ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, which is a fatal rhythm, a fatal rhythm. So those people we admit to the ICU for observation, co correct their electrolytes, um, interrogate the pacemaker or the defibrillator to see exactly what happened and watch them and ask their cardiologist to help us with the antiarrhythmic medications. Sometimes congestive heart failure is um, unstable in a way that the patient is extremely short of breath. They have swelling um, and, um, all over the body, but also they may have pulmonary edema and they're so short of breath, they need BiPAP, they need to be intubated. So we admit those patients to the ICU um, as well until we stabilize them and then eventually send them to the floor. Any electrolyte abnormality that is serious sometimes is a reason for patients to get admitted to the ICU. For example, sodium. When the sodium is very low, then patients may have a seizure. And that seizure may be a resistant seizure to conventional therapy. So we admit those patients to the ICU and correct their, electro their sodium very slowly. One of the things that we really uh, have seen is there is a move, especially in the elderly population. Actually, we have a patient that one is at Bay and one is at Gulf Coast. Uh, we have elderly, the move by the elderly population to drink a lot of water because it's healthy. Also, at the same time, there is a move to avoid a lot of salt because it's bad for the high blood pressure. So now we have somebody drinking a lot of water, almost eating very little salt, and those people will end up with uh, low sodium. And sometimes they'd be confused and they fall and they break their hips. So there is about 10 to 15% of falls that lead to hip fractures are also associated with hyponatremia or low sodium. So if you have a loved one, uh, please discourage them from doing the extreme on both sides. Don't drink a lot of water because it says it's healthy and don't eat no sodium because it is healthy as well. That in by itself can be uh, devastating too. Potassium is the electrolyte that stops the heart. And uh, high potassium is really now becoming fairly common especially when you have patients who have congestive heart failure or some form of kidney disease or they take a lot of medications, but they go to the store and they want to salt their food, but they say, you really, I don't want to put some salt on my food. I got congestive heart failure and I find this and it says no salt or low salt. And it's purely potassium. We have seen so many um, uh, devastating events and cardiac arrests related to high potassium from eating salt substitutes. Um, how about low potassium? People would know what low potassium is. People who exercise, people who really walk a lot or at night they get all these leg cramps and that is uh, most likely related also to low potassium. Uh, sometimes calcium can be high or can be low. Um, high calcium can be a result of either malignancies like cancers or now we have a craze to take calcium and vitamin D. That is correct. So we have seen a lot of cases of high calcium to the point of confusion and renal failure. And those patients we admit to the ICU to correct their high calcium. And uh, renal failure also, if it's severe, sometimes we keep them in the ICU because that could be a result or that can lead to seizures and can lead to uh, serious medical issues. 
Now, one subject that is fairly dear to my heart is sepsis. And, um, infections and sepsis is one of the most common diagnoses when patients come to the hospital. It's fairly common. Pneumonia, urinary tract infection, cellulitis, infected this, infected that. Sepsis is not necessarily only an infection. Sepsis is an event or an umbrella of events that occur and that can lead to patients being seriously sick. One of the most common findings with sepsis is actually low blood pressure and dizziness and fever, whether you, you have eradicated that infection or not. So I'll come back and uh, rebound on sepsis here um, uh, shortly, but um, it is now becoming the uh, target under the radar of the government agencies because we can make a difference. Early intervention will give us the opportunity to really save lives. And last but not least is your medical intuition. Medical intuition is an essential indication for admission to the ICU. The reason is somebody says, Doc, I don't know, but the patient looks sick. They need to be going to the ICU. Absolutely. Let's, be, let's err always on the side of safety. Always you err on the side of safety. Keep him a day in the ICU. Maybe that extra 15 minutes of your time, paperwork, and fill up more forms, and, putting, and uh, doing transfer orders and transfer information. But that patient will thank you. That patient will be very appreciative to what you do for them. So back to sepsis, it really has become a target under the radar of the CMS and all the government agencies because we can make a difference. And it has a very high mortality if not treated very well. Do you know what that means? The, the percentage here. So if I move and I stand right here and we take sepsis lightly, I would say one half will be dead and that's how serious that is. Whereas if we intervene quickly, fast, aggressively, we can make a difference. So that's why it has gained the attention of regulatory agencies, not because we want uh, the medical team to really fill more papers and uh, uh, dish out more regulations, but because if we intervene early, we can make a difference. So there's many guidelines that have been drafted to reduce mortality. Mortality is? Death, absolutely. So there, the guidelines, the purpose of the guidelines is really to make a difference in mortality. And it's centered around early recognition and um, early uh, intervention. And I am so glad that I will be doing rounds at both hospitals. And then I hear overhead, sepsis alert, sepsis alert. I'm so happy because alert means, come on, let's come together, get resources, gather resources, get the doctor, the nurses, respiratory, intubation, IV fluids, so we can really make a difference in that person's life. We can reduce that mortality from 50% or 30%. We can really recognize and intervene quickly, urgently, and make a difference. And it's not only about antibiotics. It is called the sepsis Syndrome. Syndrome is a term that describes many things put together. Hypotension, low blood pressure, tachycardia, uh, fever, confusion, uh, elevated white cells. So the sepsis syndrome in by itself is an indication for us to really uh, uh, pull the alarm and say, let's go and do something. Because by the end of the day, if you intervene early and if you intervene correctly and aggressively, you will save lives. And uh, you will make a difference for that loved one. So it is not only about, oh, the patient, we gave the antibiotics, now we can stop. It is the antibiotics, it is the IV fluids, it is the oxygen, it is the pressors, it is the resuscitation. And we can uh, reduce the complication. The complication of sepsis are ARDS, Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome, meaning the lungs eventually will respond and will get sick, and they may end up the need to be on a respirator, not because of the pneumonia, not because of the urinary tract infection and bacteria, because of the sepsis syndrome. So after two, three days, 
patient's infection is under control, we gave them antibiotics correctly, we gave them the right antibiotics correctly, but after two, three days, the patient's not breathing, short of breath, huffing and puffing, breathing 40 times a minute on BiPAP, and eventually we intubate them and we get an x-ray and they have ARDS. You will see the lung is sick, what we call capillary leaks or capillary leak syndrome. Just imagine if somebody has a fever, think about how their face is red and flush. Those are blood vessels that are dilated. Same occur with the lungs and then eventually leak fluids and the lungs become so filled with fluids and patients cannot breathe. Um, a lot of these patients get renal failure and a need for dialysis. We see this also fairly quick, uh, frequently when the sepsis is so severe and those patients end up on dialysis. And almost 30% of patients in the ICU at some time we get invited to help with their management because they're in renal failure. Um, vascular failure. Vascular failure doesn't mean that the blood vessel is clogged or there is some cream cheese and goo inside the blood vessel. <laughs> vascular, vascular failure means that the blood vessels are so dilated and the blood pressure is so low and we have to give them medications called pressors. Uh, dopamine, um, levofed, neosinephrine, these are pressors that help constrict the blood vessels to allow the blood pressure to be higher so people will do well because blood pressure, if it's very low, patients are not going to do well. So this is what's called vascular failure and that is part of sepsis and usually all these complications follow the initial septic event within two to three days. And eventually they will improve and within five to seven days we will start seeing improvements and then hopefully things will get better. Sometimes they may need to be on the respirator for a few days, sometimes they need dialysis for a few days, and sometimes they need pressors for a few days and eventually that will get better or get worse. We hope that we can make a difference and make it get better. Um, again, uh, if you are a family member or if you work in the ICU or if you do anything related to the ICU, the burden of medical care is so intense, but also the burden of documentation and paperwork and uh, things nurses have to do um, and respiratory therapist and physical therapist and even the janitorial and the nutrition service have to do in the ICU. So if you are a patient or a family of a patient, be um, also um, cognizant of the burden of that as well. They have to sometimes fill up the whiteboard and the paperwork and so forth and the patient may be dying. There is pressure from administration or from leadership to say, have you filled your chart yet? And the patient may be taking their last breath. So, when we talk about respiratory failure, I thought maybe I'll show you pictures. And for the sake of the record, none of these pictures are from any hospital here. I got it from the internet. So really, these are open pictures, not about real patients. So if you see like that actor earlier that resembles some of the people here in the room, uh, just it's a matter of coincidence. This is non-invasive ventilation. So patients is sick, short of breath, they need some respiratory support. We place them on something called a BiPAP. BiPAP is a mask that fit tight on your face and there is pressure of air and oxygen comes behind it and, and push air through. So if your muscles are tired, think about it this way. If you're breathing fast and hard, you are consuming the energy out of your respiratory muscles. Just like you just ran a marathon. And now you're asking me to breathe 40 times a minute. So these muscles are extremely fatigued and tired. So a BiPAP or a non-invasive uh, ventilation or face mask ventilation will help force air through that tight seal on the face, nose and mouth and breathe for you. So you just open your mouth and allow air in, the machine will help you breathe in and out. And that in by itself, a form of uh, ventilator support, but not all the way and not what we call intubation. So these are minor cases when you have a transient event or the patients are doing fairly well, they just need a little bit of support. 
if the patient fails, or the patient is unresponsive, or uncooperative, or have panic attacks. And lately, I had a patient that is very interesting, is a diver, so, and has been diving for years. So what they are trained to do with their mouth and nose is totally counterproductive with a face mask ventilator. So I could not really put a BiPAP on him, because every time I put a BiPAP, he react as if he wanted his mouth free and he wanted to put to bite on the edge of the mask. Because that's how he's been trained for 40 years. So sometimes you have different circumstances that will, will disallow you to continue or to initi initiate the use of a BiPAP. And then you may have to do something called uh, endotracheal intubation. Endotracheal intubation is a tube that is about this long, and a plastic pliable tube that goes through the mouth, sometimes through the nose, but most of the time through the mouth, into the windpipe. And then we attach it to a uh, tubing, and we attach it to the respirator, and we breathe for the patient. There are many disadvantage, disadvantages for this in regards to as a family member. This is very uncomfortable. So we have to sedate the patients, and we have to give them medicines, not only for sedation, but medicines for pain. So when the loved one comes to visit, Daddy, are you okay? Can you talk to me? So they come panicking to the doctor. They're not responsive. Can you, uh, I, need them, I need to talk to them. So our commitment is to the patient's comfort and safety. So just because the son or the daughter or the wife wants to talk to the patient, is not a reason for us to inconvenient that patient by withdrawing away from them uh, breathing mat uh, comfort material, comfort uh, and uh, uh, pain medicines and sedations. Um, so it's really for a few days, hoping that whatever event has happened, whatever the event it was, congestive heart failure, pneumonia, sepsis, all that is getting better and eventually we will be able to pull the tube and allow the patient to breathe on their own. So this is a temporary method, and usually we like to keep that tube no more than seven to eight days. There's many studies today that prove and encourage what is something called a tracheostomy. A tracheostomy is a tube that sits right there in the middle of the neck, and it allows us as the healthcare team to do what was called uh, airway um, hygiene. We can clean the airways with aspiration of all the bacteria and sputum. We, the patient will not be on uh, medications to make him sedated. The reason is they're awake and they're alert. Sometimes they can write. Most of the time they can communicate one way or the other and they do a lot of things. So this is a patient who is really fully awake and alert. At the same time, they need ventilatory support. So we, at, in the medical community, any time when a physician or the medical staff come to you and say, your loved one needs a tracheostomy, this is a, an improvement, is not a step backwards, but a step forward towards improvement. Because we know the patients will feel better, Based on research and study, we know pneumonia rates is better and weaning rates are better. Um, this is a patient who is very sick. And uh, this is also an actor. Um, this time he's not from Hollywood. Um, an actor, and he's wearing a pink shirt. Why? Thank you. So uh, uh, wearing a pink shirt, but uh, this is a patient that needed a form of a very aggressive ventilator device for a device for respiratory therapists. They may have seen this once or twice in their career or lifetime, unless you do pediatric uh, respiratory therapy. But this is an um, oscillator. It uh, that was the first time I used it in my career. It sounds like you're in a jet um, engine room. And it's, it's very sophisticated and complicated. Fortunately, that patient who was on the oscillator had the flu and ended up with pneumonia and ended up on the respirator. And when the sepsis got better and the ventilator got better, she was extubated and she was able to walk home. 
and again, she passed by select at uh, one time. Later, once you're on the ventilator, we have to give you sedation for pain, and uh, uh, we have to give you drips for sedation, and drips for pain, and they are unresponsive. Now, how are we gonna feed those patients? If it was me on the ventilator on the, with the ET tube, tube down my throat, I really would like my uh, latte and frappuccino in the morning. So how are you gonna get this if the mouth has a tube in it or the ET tube? So if the patient is not intubated, what we do is we put a nasogastric tube. So that tube goes all the way down to the stomach. So we can feed, we can put medicines, we can pump the stomach out if somebody has blood or air or fluid or had blockages, or if we have any reason we need to have access to the stomach. But if the patient cannot swallow, massive stroke, cannot swallow from surgery, or for whatever reason, we put those NG tubes. Keep in mind, uh, it is very painful and very uncomfortable. So if you're involved with one of those patients, look for every opportunity at any moment of time, of any day of the week, and the month, and the year, to really see if you can pull that NG tube. It's very uncomfortable, very painful, because that tube is fairly stiff. Now, if a patient is intubated and sedated and not taking any medicine and, and not uh, taking anything by mouth, we like to put the tube in the mouth. It's the same tube, but rather than going through the nose, it goes through the mouth. It's a little bit more convenient, less traumatic, and we, it serves the same purpose. Now, people will say, well, what's the difference between the nose and the mouth? The, the difference is tremendous. Number one, trauma to the sinuses and the nose, and the risk of sinusitis. You gotta remember that we stand up, and we walk, and we actually blow our nose. Well, I do, I don't know, just maybe it's... Uh... So we blow our nose to clean the sinuses. When you're supine in bed in the ICU, you cannot clean your sinuses, and if you cannot clear or clean your sinuses, there is a risk of sinusitis. So NG tubes will increase the risk of sinusitis. So we prefer in the ICU not to use NG tubes if the patient is intubated, but to use OG tubes. If the patient is gonna need nutrition for a long time, massive stroke, uh, surgery to the mouth, need a radiation for the mouth, head and neck cancer, or many different reasons, we put a percutaneous uh, gastrostomy tube, or a PEG, and the purpose of it is actually drip nutrition straight into the stomach. And uh, this is an animation, and uh, this is a patient, supposedly, and the PEC tube sits right in the middle of the stomach. And you can put uh, food, you can put uh, medications, nutrition, liquid, and I've seen patients put also alcohol in it. <laughs> if you can't drink and you want to get that high. So, one of the other complications of uh, sepsis and infection in the ICU is renal failure and dialysis. Now, this, this subject is fairly passionate to me, the reason I've been doing this for 30 years, so I, I learned to love it after 30 years. But also, I wanted to share with you a concept that most people don't know, and they think that dialysis is actually a treatment to help the kidneys. Dialysis is actually a replacement function of the kidneys when the kidneys get sick with sepsis. It has nothing to do with the kidney function. It does not promote kidney health. It does not promote uh, kidney improvement. And if any, could potentially make the kidney failure worse if somebody is dialyzed more frequently than is needed. So in the ICU only, in the setting of acute kidney failure, not chronic dialysis outpatient, in the setting of acute kidney failure, I prefer to dialyze people less and allow their kidneys to recover. Usually they recover within five to seven days. Now, she's not a paid actress. 
Raise your hand. Have you seen how many people recover from acute renal failure? We have a patient today that has just recovered from acute renal failure and off dialysis. So the less dialysis, the better it is. So if your loved one or if you work in the ICU and you say a patient is in kidney failure, let's dialyze him every day for five hours and pull as much fluid as we can. What would you say? The less dialysis, the better it is for recovery. So it is not to jumpstart the kidneys, but to replace the kidney function. And eventually, once the general condition, the sepsis improves, patients will eventually improve. And usually that takes five to seven days after recovery. So the patient will be out of sepsis, will be out of the ICU, extubated, walking on the floor. They still have a dialysis catheter hanging. Doc, I feel great. How come my kidneys haven't recovered? Start counting. Five to ten days, you will start seeing things improving. Acute dialysis is reversible in most of the time, meaning that somebody has acute renal failure come into the ICU with sepsis, end up on dialysis for a short period of time, and it eventually is reversible. How many times have I seen this? I see one case every week. The less dialysis, the better it is. And sometimes there's two types of dialysis. There's dialysis two, three times a week, and sometimes patients who are very sick, we do it continuously around the clock until they get better. Once they get better, we start taking away how much dialysis we give, allow the kidneys to function um, on their own to improve. So somebody that is hypotensive from sepsis, somebody is very swollen, or somebody that we put on dialysis and the next thing they drop their pressure, we put on something called continuous dialysis or continuous renal replacement therapy. Um, Again, this is a uh, continuous dialysis machine. It's fairly sophisticated. It is not like the usual dialysis machine. And these are fairly sick patients who are in the ICU. Um, many drips, ventilator, uh, many monitors, and so forth. So dialysis, or correcting the electrolyte abnormalities that are related to kidney failure, is essential in the ICU. And that's why most ICUs have nephrologists involved with them. Now, one thing I wanted to share with you from a philosophical standpoint of view that we really need to be aware of. There are a lot of things in the ICU that are being done that has no proven theories and no proven effect behind them. So, if a physician says, well, I'm not going to do this because it really doesn't work, doesn't mean that if it's out there, we have to apply it. If you have a drill and you wanted to cut a cake, you have a drill and a knife, but the drill seems fancy and sexy and uh, entertaining, I'm going to take that drill and cut the cake with it because it's there. You have that machine, Doc, can you use it on my dad? Doesn't mean that's the case. So really beware. There are many therapies that are out there that have no science behind them. And they can be harmful. And they can create a technological blunder. I mean, we have a lot of things in the ICU, and there are some machines that I don't know how to turn them on. <laughs> Doesn't mean that every patient we have to, to put the machine on them and collect data and institute things that we don't know if it's going to work or make a difference. And if we do, sometimes you could end up with complications. If we want to put some form of a, of a vascular monitor on a patient and we put it inside the artery, but at the same time we're giving them medicines to, to constrict that artery because their blood pressure is low, the artery constricts, 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 you may have a blood clot and you may have a cold leg and an ischemic leg. How many times have I seen this? Many times. So just because we have an intravascular or intra-arterial monitor doesn't mean we have to put it on every patient because you could uh, create more complications than actual benefits. Uh, sometimes patients' expectation is the opposite. Doc, I want everything. You know, uh, can we not do this? I read yesterday about kidney transplants. My dad is just only 90 years old and he's in liver failure, heart failure, on the ventilator, and now you're telling me about dialysis? Can we send them today to such and such institution for a kidney transplant? 
Okay? These are called patient expectations. Not everything that is listed out there can be applied to patients. We had a, another patient that had uh, um, an injury um, and had crush injury, ended up with an amputation. And all what he wanted, people may remember this that are about my age or just around my age, the six million dollar bionic man. Okay, so this patient wanted two bionic knees. He said, I want, can you put a gadget in them to make me be able to jump because I want to be like the bionic man. So sometimes expectations are un, uh, unrealistic. Um, there is also another factor that sometimes um, certain therapies are driven by financial um, institutions and driven by um, profits and profitability. How many times you go to the um, uh, car repair joint and it, you, you wanted an oil change and they uh, pop the hood and they see, oh, you need this changed as well. I can see your sparker plugs got only 20,000 miles on them. They need to change them today. And the tires need this and so forth. So you're going for $19.99. You end up with $280. <laughs> okay? So just because there are availabilities, don't the ICU is not an experimental grounds. It is a conservative grounds and everything should be done. It is a very, very emotionally stressful place for physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, and for patients and for um, families as well. Um, keep in mind that I, I think all of you, or the majority of you, work in a, some form of a healthcare institution. Is that correct? 90%? So you have a contract with whatever institution you work for. They tell you this is your dress code, Saturday, Sunday off, you're working next Christmas, you're off on New Year, uh, Turkey Day is not your day, and so forth. And that is a contractual relationship. We, on the other hand, as committed, dedicated humans that take care of patients, our relationship with patients is of different nature. Our relation with patients is a covenant that I will do what's right and what's good for you. So with this, an ICU spirit will change because we will always do the right thing for the patients. And sometimes institutions may not be very happy, but that's a contract, that's not a covenant. Our relationship with patients in the ICU is a covenantal relationship. And that's why we always do what's right for the patients and the family. With this, if you have any questions or comments, I will be uh, willing to answer. Comments, questions? Wow. <laughs> this is actually a great feature. They all have questions. So, okay, so now it's my turn to ask questions. How much time do I have? Oh. Okay, so I'll, ha I'll ask a few questions. On a scale of 1 to 10, and 10 being the most, um, uh, the, the highest score, and 1 being the lowest score. Would you say that this was close to what you do, or uh, any hands close to what you do? Five, four, five, seven, what, two, one? You work in the ICU? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, Thank you so very much. I hope I was able to really shed some light for you, for people who really don't know what happens behind closed doors or what happens in doctor's meetings. One quick question. Could you explain briefly the difference between the machine dialysis we see in the ICU and the peritoneal dialysis folks do at home? What? Okay. Well, so the question is, what is the difference between the, heat, the, machi the dialysis machine that we see um, in the hospital or in the dialysis clinics and the peritoneal dialysis. Well, this is outside the subject, but I'll give you a one minute, so it will be very helpful. And if you subscribe, there is a video on peritoneal dialysis. But 
Basically, what it is, in peritoneal dialysis, we place a tube inside the peritoneal cavity. So every di peritoneal dialysis patient would have a tube on this side, and they fill it up with clean fluids and let it sit for about four to six hours. And during that time, exchanges of impurities occur. And then after six hours, you open that uh, tube and you drain the fluid. And that fluid will have whatever you put in and whatever leached impurities from the body into that fluid and you throw it away. And you repeat this process over and over and over again. And you can do this at home, you can do this at the car, you can do this at night using a machine. So really peritoneal dialysis provides a lot more independence than hemodialysis. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. This is just a, an ethical question. Is that uh, in Europe, apparently, and in Asia, the, most people are given peritoneal dialysis. Most people get that. Whereas in America, most people get hemodialysis three times a week, which is very costly, expensive. Uh, do you feel that possibly some uh, financial gain sort of pushed that into the limelight? So the question is, why is America pushing hemodialysis versus uh, uh, Europe uh, and Asia and Canada and South America? Uh, <laughs> push, for, uh, hemoda uh, push for peritoneal dialysis. This is a very, very convoluted subject. A very convoluted subject. And it's really... Uh, there is many factors, and it's the time is, I need about six hours <laughs> to explain things. There's political factors, there's financial factors, there is the, the Americans as humans versus, um, uh, versus um, others, and very, the culture, the society, religion, different things that regulate this. So this is not the right venue, but your observation is correct, and the reason is not uh, uh, financial only. There may be a very small financial portion, but there's many other reasons to make a difference in, in the treatments. Thank you so very much for your attendance, and I'll see you in about 10 minutes. <laughs>